The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 121. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Next Generation episode called Lonely Among Us. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. I hadn't seen this episode in <laughs> at least 25 years. Because not yep. only, I mean, the first season episodes are not my favorite. And yeah, right. and this is one of my least favorites. In fact, when you announced the title of it, I couldn't last time. I couldn't even remember which one this was. Yeah, same, same here. here. But then I looked it up. It's oh, it's that one. Yeah. So <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Let's strap in and <laughs> settle in for this one. So this is the as you mentioned, first season episode. It's the seventh episode of the first season. It's the first bottle show on Next Gen, which is means that, as we know, it's the first show that takes place entirely on the sets built for the, the ship. Yeah, we don't even get to go to Planet Hell, which was the name, <laughs> name of the set they had for planets. Right. <laughs> yep. This is the second appearance of Cole Meany, who will eventually be Chief mm. O'Brien, but he doesn't even get a name in this one, I don't think. Nope. He's uh, literally first security guard in the closing credit. That's, that's it. That's right. Oh, um, I didn't even know that. It's just, here comes Call Meany walking down the corridor. Yeah, it's <laughs> just, right. right it, la, la, it's like, that was my first thought. It's like, man, Chief O'Brien gets such a disrespect. He's not even recognized as, like, Chief O'Brien. He's just first <laughs> security guard. Right. <laughs> yeah. We saw him in the pilot where he was, where he was a red uniform, and he was uh, at the helm of yep. the battle bridge uh, in that mm-hmm. one. Uh, this also is the first appearance of actor Mark Alamo yeah. from Star Trek. On Star Trek. He, he is oh, I missed that. On Star Trek, yes. He is, so he'll eventually be Gold Ducat in uh, DS9, but in this, he is one of the Antikins. He's the chief Antikin, you know, the, the, the dog-headed people in this one, or whatever oh. they are, <laughs> canine creatures. He did not want to be credited by name in this, because he was afraid of people getting the wrong idea about his acting, I guess, from this. He wasn't sure how it would come off. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, uh, probably good move. <laughs> it's, it's, inter- it's interesting to see him in other roles without the makeup. If you ever yep. like yes. watch stuff he did earlier, like he was in the 1970s two-part TV miniseries Helter Skelter about mm, the, uh. about the Manson murders. He plays like a sheriff or police officer, detective guy who's helping investigate. Right, right. And then he, of course, he was without the makeup in the the episodes of Deep Space Nine, where it was the flashback to the 20s or yeah. whatever yep. it was. I forget 50s. What the exact, 50s what, or I guess, whenever yeah. it was, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this episode is sort of patterned a little bit on Journey to Babel from the original series, which yeah. is no surprise since DC Fontana did a rewrite. The Enterprise is headed to a peace conference carrying two warring peoples who want to become Federation members. In this case, it's the Antikins and the Soleil. No, no, no. It's the cobra-headed lizard people and the white wolf <laughs> lizard people. Right. Antigens are the white wolves. The Soleil are the, uh, cobra the, heads. the cobra heads, who we hardly see at all, by the way, in this episode. We don't see them very much. They're being delivered to the sector's neutral ground conference planet called Parliament, so um, which we never hear about ever, ever again. So the Soleil are beamed aboard. So they... They're both residents of the same system, and they've been at war forever. The the what is it? Mm-hmm. The Beta Renner system, anyway. We you get very quickly up up front that they don't like each other, and it's very tricky to have them both on the same ship. The Soleil leader demands to be quartered upwind of the Antikins, in which I'm going. 
Which direction is upwind on a starship? I was I was gonna say, do starships have you know air patterns <laughs> yeah. of how the air flows through them? I Presumably, mean... you could get out the air condition. I mean, there are all those ducts people crawl through. So <laughs> that's, right. Yeah. that's right, all the Jeffrey's tubes. I mean, so I mean, if they're really worried about the the, the the Enterprise D was big enough, they could put one like you know. Ten forward and one in the end of the the in the shuttle bay. deck, <laughs> yeah, 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 like in the shuttle bay. Oh, yeah. Well, or my solution: just put them on different decks, which right, yeah. which, which I guess is, they which they, they do because later we see them encountering each other, and it's you're not supposed to be on our deck, so okay, they put them on different decks, yeah. right. So uh, and then on the bridge, we get Riker and Picard talking about how Riker doesn't understand the hostility of p- passionate <sighs> hatred. And, mm-hmm. and there's the usual poo-pooing of holding strong views about religion and economics, and it's so condescending as first season is. How ridiculous people would fight over stuff like that. There's so much <laughs> preachiness in this about, oh, yeah, there are, people used to get all bent out of shape about God concepts and even economic systems. Ha, 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 how ridiculous is that? And <laughs> humans no longer enslave animals for food purposes. <laughs> yes, is that too. Oh, yeah. Ta- Tasha Yar, who came from one of the most violent colonies possible in the federation even she's like repulsed by all this it's like really yeah Yeah, it doesn't doesn't make sense and also so if we no longer keep animals for food you know what that means vastly fewer animals exist Mm -hmm. and get get to live so it's like when we invented cars lots of horses didn't get the chance to ever be born and right. so if you're no longer using cows and pigs and chickens for food, lots of cows and pigs and chickens never get to be born and experience well, life. And, and of course, we know later that the lie is put to this because they, yes. they show animals being used in markets and stuff like that, even yes. in TNG later. Yeah. So, I, I like the fact that the Anakins think replicated food is barbaric. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a nice term. But but the Enterprise crew gets to be condescendingly like, ha ha, you're very silly, uh, well, it, barbaric people. But it, it's funny, too, because, again, even in TNG, they make the point that replicated food does not taste like real food. Yeah. Right. It, you know, it's close, <laughs> but it's, it's like eating, you know, frozen, you know, TV dinner versus like a homemade meal. Yeah, although well, though here they deny that because Riker says their replicated meat tastes just as tasty, but is like nah. Later yeah, on, well, they'll, then but... eat the real thing. Then yeah. <laughs> that's what I would say. Well, yeah. and it's Captain, interesting. To... Captain Cisco's father would disagree with that, but yes, it's interesting to see over the years from TOS to TNG to DS9 and now to Discovery how a- contemporary attitudes toward food or the future of food come out in mm-hmm. the in this show that's created then. So back in the 60s, the future of food was going to be, you know, all processed and it was going to be highly processed, nutritious. It wasn't going to look like food. You have those little cubes, yep. remember? And then the jello this, cubes. Yeah. Yes. And then in the 80s, we get this like, well, we'll have food that looks like food, but it's going to be fake. We won't, you know, use real animals. Uh, and then by discovery, you know, they're eating burritos. They're eating, you know, <laughs> it's replicated <laughs> Food that's real food. It, so it's just very interesting. I just want my bowl of tribbles. They're fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> I love If the that guy thing. ain't squirming, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just want my Rock to Gino at Starbucks. With the... Actually, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Do they make a decaf? No, uh, I don't drink decaf. So uh, anyway, they're, they're, they encounter an energy field while they're traveling at warp speed. A so they have to warp investigate cloud. Space yep. Warp Cloud. There's a lot, apparently a lot of those in Star Trek. And they seem to be confused about the difference between matter and energy and how there's not a difference, but okay. <laughs> right. Mm. Uh, Jordy and Worf, while, they're, while the, this investigation is about to happen, are working in the room we will never see again, the sensor maintenance yep. room, when the <laughs> Enterprise accidentally passes through the cloud, and then Worf gets zapped by a uh, control panel that's not properly grounded, apparently. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. When Crusher arrives, so he's knocked unconscious. When Crusher arrives, he wakes up, starts attacking them, throws a medic across the room, which is I love, and then he's sedated. Well, I love that where you know they're worried about war, and this poor <laughs> this poor medic is like woozily getting to his feet, and they're like, "Oh, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, you're right over there. <laughs> yeah, I just got thrown across the room by a Klingon, but uh, yeah, I'm good." Uh, in sick bay, Beverly examines Worf, and then she gets zapped by the blue energy. But she's not knocked out, so this it, it's a different experience. Yeah. So we get the understanding now that there's this 
energy that's shocking different people and being passed from person to person and making them act all funny. Right. Because Troy arrives, Beverly's acting weird, Worf wakes up, he doesn't remember anything, so something has happened. On the bridge, Picard tells Data that the mystery of what's going on will have to wait until, uh, and what's up with this cloud, we'll have to wait until after their mission. Picard says uh, to Data, I love a mystery, Data, but this one will have to wait until we deliver the delegates to their peace conference on Parliament. Then he turns and says, Time and tide, Lieutenant LaForge. Go to warp eight. I actually love that line because it's mm-hmm. such a, it's a classic throwback to mm-hmm. sailing ships. Time and tide waits for no man is the, is the actual yep. line uh, the, that he's quoting, which is, I think, a Shakespeare reference, it must be. If it's Picard, um, it actually, I, I I saw that it dates back even to like Chaucer. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but uh, I do like that uh, throw in there. Crusher goes to her quarters where she acts weird around Wesley for a nice change of pace, uh, <laughs> and because uh, usually it's Wesley <laughs> acting weird. And then uh, she shows unusual interest in his warp theory class. So that, that's and a, then a, immediately a... loses interest in it as soon as she realizes <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with navigation. <laughs> right. Right. So she goes to the bridge because she wants something to, uh, that has to do with the helm, navigation. Mm-hmm. When she goes to the science console, an energy release goes from her into the console. So now we've mm-hmm. passed this energy into the ship itself. Yep. They start getting malfunction warnings from all over the ship. I like the fact that when Picard asks Data the chances of this happening randomly, he doesn't calculate exact yes. odds a la C-3PO. He just says... Yep. It's a virtual impossibility. Thank I, you, Data. I know. Even, even I, yeah. I was really, I was just expecting him to reel off a string of numbers. And it's like, yeah, yeah. that's refreshing for once. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're about to hit a, a place where it's like, okay, Data's dictionary is offline again. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. He needs to reconnect to Wikipedia. Well, I, I like I kind of like Picard where he's almost showing himself to be a kind of sort of a Luddite sort of because he's, you know, as these, all these defects are going, it's like, this is a brand new ship that should, you know, yeah, well, yeah almost kind of like give me the old school ship where it's like, you know, manual controls instead of the automated <laughs> stuff, you know. Well, yeah. Should things be breaking down already? Well, shakedown cruises. That's oh, what they're I, for. I, I was yeah. going to say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have a meeting, a bunch of unfamiliar officers in the conference room. The engineer of the week, called Mr. Singh, has no explanation. Uh, well, at this point, they do yeah. later name check Chief Engineer Argyle, and so yes. Singh is Assistant Chief Engineer. That's right, Assistant Deputy Chief Engineer. Yeah, but there's <laughs> no <something>. reason. There's no <laughs> in story reason why Argyle is not here, but there is yeah. an out of story reason, which is Singh going to die. So yeah, exactly. we didn't we didn't want to kill Argyle, so we brought in a new guy this week. That's right, <laughs> poor actor. For... <laughs> There's a scene there. It, sometimes you can tell who's going to die based on who's in an, who's unfamiliar that is mm-hmm. playing a familiar function on the ship. There's yes. even one episode. It's one of the Q episodes it, uh, where it may be the first, but there's a Q episode where Q shows up. And Jordy like gets up from the helm and leaves, and another guy comes and sits down, and <laughs> right. then that's the guy that dies. And then Jordy comes back and sits down. And yeah. like, clearly, they got Jordy out of the helm seat just so they could kill this guy. <laughs> Good timing to have to go to the bathroom. Yeah, oh. yeah. If Jordy ever get wants to like tap out of something, don't take it. It's in somebody else. <laughs> uh, so uh, then we have a scene of Riker confiscating the Antigen's butchering tools because they're weapons, and some of them were found loitering near the Soleil quarters. Yeah. They're basically um, handheld lasers that you would, you yes. know, you, yep. you use like a knife. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is basically Riker and Yar being the TSA at this point. Yeah. Uh, so yep. So the uh, now the Enterprise's warp engines and subspace radio go offline, and so data and. Picard and Riker are trying to figure out who the saboteur is. And then we have, as you mentioned, Jimmy, another of Data's weird lapses of knowledge. He doesn't know what a private eye is. Right. Or Sherlock Holmes, apparently. Yep. Oh, and this leads to a lot of really painful, non-comedic Sherlock Holmes role play on Data's part. (laughs) It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be, but it's not. (laughs) I'll credit to Brent Spiner for giving it a go, but... uh, Hey, yeah. at least this was the first time he could actually act. Right, he was allowed you know, to act like, no. and do something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Wesley in the engine room finds the solution to the warp engine problem, but has to go to class. 
Because once again, Wesley is smarter than everyone else, but is not believed by the grown-ups in the room. Like, you'd think they would have learned after the Traveler incident to listen to Wesley when it comes to the engines, but no. I, I did like a couple things. One of the things is this apparently isn't a mechanical problem yes. they're dealing with. It's a problem with the computer drive that's controlling the warp engines. Right. And Wesley points out to Assistant Chief Engineer Singh that if that at this point in the system, and Singh like finishes his sentences for his sentence for him, it would cause the commands to go down dead ends. Yeah. So the there's a failure point where if if they don't make it through this passage, the commands will get rerouted to where they're not supposed to go, and it won't happen. The engines won't obey the commands. So I like that. I also like how he. Does he sympathizes with Wesley's desire not to go study, but he says, "Look, the captain's orders are really strict on this. You're you're scheduled for right. class time right now." And Wesley's also being homeschooled. You know, he's doing his study mm -hmm. in his in his room with his computer. Right. Yep. So uh, Singh, meanwhile, is still in the in the engine room by himself, apparently, and he gets zapped by the blue energy coming out of a console and is killed, thus having the distinction of being the first Enterprise crewman killed in TNG. Wow, this many episodes. Yeah, yeah, it's the first one, at least according to what I saw. I'm trying to think. And everybody was confused because he wasn't wearing a red shirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, the re red and red and gold changed. I know, yeah. I know, they reversed. <laughs> so, uh, of course, Jordy and Worf ignore Wesley's insights as to what is wrong as they investigate, as I mentioned. Troy wants to do hypnosis on Worf and Crusher to get to the bottom of their lost time memory lapses. Yeah, I expected her to say something like, oh, uh, hypnosis, it's a 19th and 20th century pseudoscientific concept that doesn't actually enhance memory, but I want to do it to you anyway. <laughs> what episode of Mysterious World did we talk about that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to put a link for that. Uh, Troy, and she'll eventually use a glowing light box to hypnotize them. And uh, so, At least she didn't up. get like out a fob watch and swing it in front of them <laughs> or, use right. a, or use a spiral or something. Yes. Uh, Troy does report to, the, to uh, her investigation of Riker and Data, and Data is smoking a meerschaum pipe and acting like Holmes, which oh, no, is, it's make, causes everyone to smirk. It's a Calabash. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Cal that's right. A meerschaum is all that ivory-looking. Mineral. Uh, thing. Yeah. Yes. I like how so he's smoking it he, in front of Riker and and um, Tasha, and they're in the briefing room, and they don't bat an eye until he walks past and, with it. And they kind of wave it away. Well, but... Tasha does, yeah. yeah. But I find it annoying that so Data is like in full Sherlock Holmes mode in this. He's imitating yeah. Sherlock Holmes speech patterns wrongly. He keeps <laughs> he keeps saying indubitably. And I, so I've heard the Sherlock Holmes stories many, many times because I listened to them falling asleep. And I didn't remember Sherlock Holmes ever saying indubitably. So I have the complete Sherlock Holmes in electronic format. I did a search. Sherlock Holmes never says the word indubitably or the word indubitable. So this is something <laughs> picked up from elsewhere. This, yeah. is, I, this is kind of the, the, you know, kind of the Frank false Scarlet. memory type effect, you know, yeah. where it's people think they remember something from or, you know, people are known for something, but they really never said it or did it. Yeah. Yes. All And they later do that as well, where he tries to bend the elementary, my dear Watson line to elementary, my dear Riker. And Sherlock Holmes never says elementary, my dear Watson. That never happens. Right. Which oh, well, is, is funny, given the TV series called Elementary, which features Sherlock Holmes. Well, well he does and, say and, things but also, are elementary, but not my elementary, yeah. my dear Watson. But this this is kind of along the lines of, you know, how many times in the original series did they say, beam me up, Scotty? Never. Yeah, never. never. <laughs> they say, beam me up, or, you know, yeah. two to beam up, or something like that. Right. Data's also got this weird affectation with the pipe where he, like, clicks it with his teeth, like this. I don't know <laughs> if that came through or not, but... <laughs> But it's just really weird, and it all this Sherlock. He later pulls out when when Picard actually rather politely says, "Let's proceed without the pipe." He puts it down, yeah. and then he whips out a magnifying glass, <laughs> right. and, and 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 the fish tank in Picard's office makes a bubble noise for the first and only time ever, just so yes. Data can turn and comedically ex inspect it with the magnifying glass. Yeah. And it's like, oh, man, this Sherlock Holmes roleplay is so painful. 
Play it straight, people. Play it straight. So Data has deduced that the Antikins and Slayans were too busy attacking each other to sabotage the ship and kill Mr. Singh, uh, given their, what they're doing. Um, then we have uh, Troy hypnotizing Crusher, and she recalls another presence being with them at some point when she was possessed, uh, and Worf confirms with them. Troy reports to Picard that she sensed another presence in Worf and Crusher. Data says they've eliminated as suspects everyone they know is on the ship and says, I am referring to the great detective's credo, sir. Oh, here we go. I quote, we must fall back on the old axiom that when other contingencies fail, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I like how it, a much better use of that is in Star Trek VI, The Search for Peace. Mm -hmm where yep. <laughs> Leonard Nimoy is talking at the beginning and he said, to Kirk, and he says, as one of my ancestors said, whenever you eliminate the Im impossible, whatever <laughs> remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And so I love yep. the reality canon-bending thing there where Sherlock Holmes <laughs> is one of Spock's ancestors. Yes, I like, I like that. <laughs> well, kind of uh, like Shakespeare was Klingon, so I mean... Yeah. Right, in the original Klingon. I also like one of the things they do with Troy where she's talking about, because if you've got this mental ener energy thing running around, Picard wants to know, well, why haven't you told us about it? It's kind of your job. And she says, right. well, I did sense this duality in them, but I, I didn't realize what it was because I always sense duality in everybody, even you, Captain. When you're considering what you're going to do, you think, well, maybe I'll do mm. this or maybe I'll do that. And so I get these conflicting plans and thoughts from y'all all the time and i thought this was just that yeah that was interesting yeah when you when you're when you're thinking to yourself what to do the, yeah. you're talking to yourself so in, in your for head. once we have a decent explanation because she's not a full-on telepath she can't just right. see right. oh i'm an alien energy being here you know yes so we have we have a reasonable explanation for why her powers don't achieve plot goals here as yep. opposed to all of the times where she's simply not present or yep. they accomplish goals they shouldn't be able to achieve, like, oh, I detect mm -hmm. he's lying, Captain, because lying is not an emotion and you're an empath. <laughs> 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 so at this point, helm control on the bridge goes down. A card comes out onto the bridge from the ready room. He's zapped and suddenly orders the ship to double back on its course uh, and ab ab abort its mission, essentially. Yeah, this is something I wanted to comment on. So we now enter, and we're in the last 15 minutes of the episode at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and so from here on out, the episode becomes about Picard acting bizarre and testing the crew with bizarre orders and not giving them complete answers to their mm -hmm. questions and you know he's like redirecting their attention to stuff and he's and he's the tension in this is caused by the fact that what he's doing is prima facie unreasonable but it's not so unreasonable that they can just mm -hmm. remove him from command and so that's very interesting and I want to give Patrick Stewart his props cuz he really plays this well yeah. Um, but they would do this exact same thing two seasons later in the episode Allegiance, where Captain Picard has been kidnapped and replaced by an alien that wants to under or a pair of aliens that want to understand how human power structures work, so he's deliberately testing them. And there, there's a rationale for why we're putting the crew through all these bizarre orders. Here, it's just the alien thing wants to get back to the energy cloud. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. reasonable enough, but it's it's done to much better effect later on. But even here, Patrick Stewart does a good job with it, although yep. there are failures on the writing level. Like his first order when he says to, when he wants him to go back, he says, uh, make our heading 925 Mark 37. And Jordy turns around and says, you want us to reverse our course? And what Jordy should have said, since there are 360 degrees in a circle, is <laughs> mar heading 925, Mark 37, you want us to make two complete circles in, and then half <laughs> another one and reverse our course? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And they yeah. later do explain that the whole heading mark system is based on a 360-degree circle. They establish that in data lore. That's true. I was going to say, at this point, I don't think they've really thought about what the whole they heading... Throwing random work. stuff out. Yeah. So uh, Riker has Crusher, Data, Geordi, and Troy in his quarters discussing mutiny because Troy now senses that duality in Picard well, she was talking about. The, the, the official polite it within regulations mutiny. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. By the way, Riker has a big Galileo 7 model, shuttle yes. model in his quarters, which is nice. I, I also, I like what they do with the regulations here. They, they talk about how Beverly could relieve him of command, but Jordy yep. points out it's buku trouble if you do it and you're wrong. Right. And she also notes, I'd need, and this actually harks back to the original series, because McCoy made the same comment, I'd have to have a medical log supporting this decision before I do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Riker, as the first officer, could also remove him. And Riker says, yes, but only if all of the command officers agreed it was absolutely necessary. Yes. The and, 25th Amendment is effective here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they toss this around, and eventually they decide to do neither. What they want to do is gather more evidence by having Beverly run some medical psychological tests on Picard and she tells Riker that he'll need to back her up somehow. Right. And when they actually have the conversation with Picard, who's acting oddly calm about everything, Riker is very forthright and says, Captain, it is my duty to inform you that we have a reason to believe that you may have fallen under an alien influence and are endangering the ship and that's why we need these tests. Right. And then he responds, I consider it equally possible that the two of you and Council Troy are overworked and hallucinating, and so I'm ordering psychological tests for you. So go test yourself, yep. <laughs> as opposed exactly. to some other things he could have said. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they have to go do that first. Uh, but Crusher does go to Picard again and talks to the entity who talks back to her. Yeah, she's delivering the test results, and he doesn't even yes. want to look at them. He doesn't care. And right. the alien, like, totally blows his cover. You know, right. Beverly says, are you the Jean-Luc Picard I know? And he's like, I am that and more. Yes. And 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 she he really just totally blows his cover right before the commercial break. <laughs> yeah. And and this should have consequences on the other side of the commercials that it doesn't. Right. Well, and, you know, speaking of uh, Patrick Stewart's acting here, by the way, I wanted to mention in that previous scene, when Riker and Crusher come in, He's standing at the viewport looking out the window, and yeah. then he comes and sits down. And as they leave, he sort of jumps up and stands next to him and kind of slouches a bit, totally un -Picard like as, mm -hmm. he's, as he's looking out the window again. And there's a very, it's a very subtle acting, well, I don't know if it's subtle, but it's very good acting. Well, like, you, you get him, it. like, kicking his, kicking his feet up on the desk, which you yeah. never see Picard do something as he's that, talking that about, casual. As he's talking about how busy he is, he's putting his feet <laughs> up on the desk. Yep. Right. But, but I also, I noticed the same thing with the acting, uh, where he's initially, he's just fascinated watching the stars fly out the, fly behind them out his window, mm -hmm. as if he's never seen that before. And then as soon as they're out of his office, he just jumps back up and goes to watch the stars again. Right, right. Very, it, it's uh, uh, very good, uh, that, that part of it. Uh, so when they get to the cloud again, the entity talks through Picard about the combination of them beaming as energy into the cloud to continue exploring the, the galaxy. Oh, first, though, when we come back from the commercial break, Riker is doing a log talking about how the captain's acting bizarre, but there's nothing, quote, there, there's nothing we can do within regulations. Yes. I'm sorry. The alien has just admitted he's possessing Picard to Beverly. <laughs> right. Relieve him now. You don't right. need any more. He's just, he has just said it. Right. Yep. She's the medical officer, chief medical officer. She can make a log about it, and they, they can relieve him. I, I was going to say, I think that could be a, a medical issue. You know, having a, an alien energy force <laughs> inhabiting your body could be, you know, qualify, yeah. qualification to remove from command. I might, yeah. might be close. Yeah. Oh, I can picture a Lower Decks episode with something like this. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when they try to stop him from leaving the ship, he sends energy beams through all of through all of them from the consoles, apparently, which incapacitates them. Oh, yeah. And by the way, one of the reasons, so the energy alien says that he and Picard are going to, like, merge, 
because they're both really keen about exploring. And so the alien being also tries to defend itself. It like says it very much regrets the uh, the death of Singh. And it was like when the inter- Enterprise passed through the cloud, it snatched it up like a big claw coming down and snatching you away into a world you never experienced. And mm-hmm. and he tries to paint itself sympathetically. And it, it sort of succeeds, you know, but mm-hmm. he's saying that it realized once it got in Picard, it realized that, oh, he's an explorer, too. And he's as excited about exploring as I am. And so we're going to leave. We're going to ditch y'all now and go to another party. (laughs) As if Picard would do that in his right mind. Right. You know, but one of the things they say is, oh, now that there he's going to be energy, Picard can travel anywhere at any velocity. And I'm going up to and including the speed of light. Whereas yeah. he's already got a ship that goes faster well, than light, which is the exactly. better way to explore. The cloud was traveling at warp speed somehow. Oh, so, okay, okay. So he can, I, but it's I'll still not faster than okay. the Enterprise. Yeah, yeah. So Picard beams out into the cloud, uh, and he's uh, he's uploaded into the cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, he's cloud based. Uh, after <laughs> and so they apparently spend a whole hour searching for Picard in the cloud. And they they're and now they're ready to leave, but then Troy senses the captain in the cloud. I sense his presence, <sighs> sensing. And then they're going to beam energy Picard back. Oh, oh I, I this is one of the things that I hated about this at the time. Yep. Is they get a sign. They it's like if only we had a sign from Picard. And so of course they immediately get a sign. What they're trying to do is let Picard into their energy systems the same way the original alien got in yep and so geordie's panel starts going crazy and the letter p appears right and it's oh man just the letter (laughs) p so obviously this is going to be the sequel to the 1982 movie q the winged serpent (laughs) But, (laughs) but they but p for picard so they get him to the transporter room this really annoyed me because even like the 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 tech guys on the crew, like Michael Akuda and others, who they were like, no, transporters don't work like this. You know, it, it, yeah. it's yes, they're fictional devices, but they're not magic. And the, so we're going to beam energy Picard back, but use his pattern that's still somehow in the pattern buffer to remake him out yeah. of the, it, the, nothing. The backup. It's 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 in the it's in the cloud backup. Right. Yeah. <sighs> and, and and Riker is to data is like. Has will this work? And Data's like, I have no idea if this will work. And so then they do it. But what they don't show us is the four deleted scenes where they they beamed back four dead Picard bodies and they just fell over before they finally (laughs) got it right. Yeah, yeah. They always get it right the first time. And and what they didn't realize is when it did finally work, nah, Energy Picard is still out there. This is just a transporter clone, and we've had a clone of the captain all this time. Oh, wait till we get to the end of the first season of Picard then. Gosh. Yeah. That's going to be the clone of a clone. Maybe, maybe that's where the real uh, energy Picard re- connected back to him. That's right. That's right. Uh, to, spo- spoilers. Don't worry. <laughs> so uh, you should have seen the, the first season of Picard because, yeah. Anyway, uh, he's back, but his memory is fragmented. He's only got his, uh, his memory up to the point where he beamed out somehow for some reason. And uh, in which case, he's not the same person because he didn't bring back memories from being an energy cloud and, thing. That's right. I was say, and wouldn't, wouldn't memories be part of your energy pattern? Yeah, uh, apparently not. So <laughs> let's just pretend that didn't happen. So Yara, Yara shows up and reports that the Anticans oh. have killed and plan to cook one of the Soleil. So Picard tells Riker to take care of it. And then we get the we should have gotten the clarinet of humor. Oh, here this is because the... that's. That's worst. what this is meant to be, is the comedic ending. And this is the worst I can remember seeing it done. Because yeah. when Yar shows up, they've got the captain back. He's going to, like Rikers just suggested, he go get some rest or something or check, go to sick bay first. And then Yar shows, so the crisis is resolved. Yar shows up in panic mode and starts explaining a critical situation. And Riker is, Lieutenant, this couldn't have waited a moment. It's like she's reporting. No. Uh, she's your security chief. If your security chief shows up in a panic, I'd give her the benefit of the doubt. 
since one right. crisis has just been resolved. Let's hear about this new one. And she's reporting a murder. Right. With attempted cannibalism. Well, it's maybe not cannibalism since they're different species, but she's reporting a murder on your ship. And and Picard is like, you deal with it, Riker. That's your comedic ending? You know, there's also a little bit of an inconsistency here because one of the cooks has just been asked to broil reptile. What? Why do you have a cook if you don't enslave animals for mm. food? Like, mm. does he just make vegetables? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so apparently the Enterprise has a cook who doesn't have anything to do usually. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. And uh, just, yeah, it's a terrible <laughs> ending. It's a terrible ending. Anyway. Uh, so any last thoughts, Father? Father Corey? No, and it, it, Jimmy, you said it's been like twenty some years since you've seen this episode. It's probably gonna be twenty some years before we see this episode again. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about this creature, this alien creature. There's a significant case that it's evil because mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. it flat out kills Singh. When it's in control of you, it suppresses your consciousness so you don't remember. Mm-hmm what happened when you were Mm -hmm. in its control. And also, when it starts to take control of you, it is against your consent. Because when Beverly is being hypnotized and remembers what happens to her magically by hypnosis, what she remembers saying, she feels this presence, and then she's like, get out of my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this was something she was resisting, and this thing was just forcing itself on her. And clearly, Picard was would not have been in his right mind, even though the alien says a, a resignation has been properly logged for being sent to Starfleet by Picard. No, the real Picard is never going to ditch his ship like this. Right. And mm-hmm. so, the, it, so the alien, whatever it was doing interacting with Picard, it was, it was manipulating him. And so even though it tries to paint itself as this fish out of water that was just desperately trying to, you know, survive and get back home, there's a significant case to be made that that's just rationalization and this thing is a psychopath. Right. That That is, yeah, yeah, that's true. And it's one, it's apparently one of a bunch of creatures. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a group thing, a colony. Yeah, Star Trek will go back to energy creatures invading the Enterprise time and time again. I mean, we had that in the original series, but yeah. it's just something they keep going back to. One thing that's interesting is this is unusual. I think it's partly because they were still figuring out what the, the types of stories they wanted to do with Next mm-hmm. Generation. This actually is kind of like what you would expect in an original series, because they had like a lot of possession stories back then, you know, like with Landry the computer and all kinds of stuff. And you don't see near as many of those, just like they used to have more time travel stories in the original series. And then for a time, you got a lot less of those in Next Gen because they were trying to distance themselves. But I got the feeling, I mean, even though DC Fontana has has a script credit on this, I mean, she's just rewriting someone else's bad script because she's a (laughs) she's a good writer. But yes. then, of course, even in Next Gen, she got rewritten by Gene Roddenberry, which would bring the quality level down again. Right. But it, this feels to me like we still haven't hit our stride yet, and so in some ways we're imitating the original series and doing it badly. Yep. Type episode. Well, that kind of describes the the first season in general. They they pulled so many concepts, uh, you know, Naked Time versus Naked Now and things like that, where yeah. it's, they, they pulled a lot from, of course, there's laughing you're talking about, you know, the, the the Enterprise getting invaded by uh, energy creatures, and they could think of Lord the opening of that Lord X episode where you had the energy creature mm-hmm. coming into the ship, and they she gets a tricorder out of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. I think that about does it for this episode. There's probably as much as we need to say about Lonely Among Us, which we will never watch again. Uh, <laughs> not even 25 <laughs> years. So uh, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Steve C., Giles C., Bob C., Sharon W., and Josh T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits this show for us every week. So that's it from us. What did you think of Lonely Among Us? Did, maybe you liked it. So let us know why and, and how. 
So, <laughs> and for what purpose? <laughs> and have you received any medical attention? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'd love to hear from you by if you go to, uh, comment on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquest media or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be watching and discussing an even better episode of Star Trek. Move along home oh. on Deep Space Nine. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Well, at least it has the greatest moment in Deep Space Nine history in it. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't worry, folks. In two weeks, we're going to be be watching the Star Trek Discovery Season 3. (laughs) We'll be away from these uh, first season episodes of the other series. But until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. I'm now depressed. (laughs) Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. I'll get you for this, Dom. (laughs) <laughs> oh, and live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, it's elementary, my dear Riker. Sir. <laughs>